Bibles, you join, uh, join me this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll look at verse 10 this morning. I'd like to talk about the perfect relationship. Perfect relationship. If you're going to have a relationship, I think it ought to be perfect. Uh, if you just want to get one to get by, just to say you have one, uh, you're probably not going to enjoy it. You want a perfect relationship no matter what kind of relationship that you're in. Here in verse 10 it says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. Perfectly joined together. There was a gentleman once, he thought, I've never ridden a horse, but I've watched a lot of westerns, and I've watched a lot of television, and I think I believe I'd like to go ride a horse. So he goes down to the stables and he asked if he could ride a horse. And uh, they obliged him by saddling up this horse. And uh, he saw uh, the horse sitting there and he knew what to do. He jumps up on the horse and he's been schooled through television through many years. And he uh, says, giddy up. And the horse takes two steps forward, then three steps back. He said, I've watched this. I know what I'm doing. So he says, giddy up. And he goes two steps forward and three steps back. Well, he thought, well, I've seen him kick him a lot of times. So he goes and sticks his heels up in that horse and he goes two steps forward, three steps back. He told the fellow at the stable, he says, I need another horse. He said, no, the horse needs another rider. 
We may think it's somebody else's problem. He says, you're doing all the right things. One way you look at it, but the other way is you're pulling on the reins and the horse can't figure out if you want it to go or to back up. You're giving it mixed signals. So even though there was potential there, there was miscommunication about really what they wanted to do and accomplish. There was a division and a mix-up. I believe that in relationships a lot of times. I believe a lot of times that uh, there's mixed signals, misunderstanding of what we're really trying to accomplish. He knew here the church and their relationship wasn't what it ought to be. It was divided. There was defilement in it. And there was disgrace in the unity. A disgrace. You may be in a relationship and you think this relationship is a disgrace. It's not pleasing. It's not beneficial. There's problems. We want a good relationship. I think about relationships in God's Word. I think about the relationship of uh, Jacob. Jacob, he was on a journey and he met this young lady by the name of Rachel. And you know about this relationship? He said, I want a relationship with this young lady. He had a desire for a relationship with this young lady. To the point that he's willing to work for it. He says, I'll work seven years for her. That's what he told her dad. I'll work seven years for her. He says, I want that relationship He had a desire for that relationship and he's willing to work for it. So he worked the seven years and you know the story. How that uh, after seven years he had a wedding and uh, after the wedding he woke up the next morning and realized that uh, his father-in-law had made a trick and slipped in the ugly daughter on him. And he had married the wrong one. But yet he didn't give up. You know, even though that relationship didn't work out that he worked for, he worked seven more years He was willing to work for it. Seven more years. Fourteen years. Is there any woman worth working fourteen years for? He thought so. He thought so. I mean, we got got to believe that whoever we want to be with, first we've got to have a desire, and we've got to have a willingness to work for it. To work for it. All right, let's be a little more fair. How many men are worth working fourteen years for? Two days for, I mean, anything. I mean, come on, give me something. But I mean, you had to be willing to work for that relationship. I think about also in a good, perfect relationship, not only do you have to be willing and have the desire to work, I think it sort of needs to be part of God's plan. Because if we're going away from God's plan rather than toward God's plan, I, I believe we've got a problem. I mean, if we're doing it our way, is one way, but doing it God's way is another. Following God's plan. There was a man in God's word by the name of Isaac that God had a plan, a person for him to be in a relationship with, and his father was sending his servants to get this woman. And he said, how are we supposed to know which one is? God's got a plan. He knows how to work this out, make it work out. Now, Look, there's miracles that take place every day. These servants was talking to Isaac's dad here. And he said, you want us to go get him a wife and bring her back here? How do we know which one to get? They say, she's going to do this and she's going to do this and she's going to do that. And you'll know that's her. I've got got it planned out. And the next thought that they had he said, well, you have this planned out, but what woman in her right mind is going to come and travel back and marry this guy that had never met him and knows nothing about him? Well, God's got a plan. So they go and they follow God's directions for their life. And they go to this woman and they found Rebecca. And just as God had already prepared the heart, prepared the path, and prepared the plan for a perfect relationship, guess what? She said yes. She said yes. 
God has a perfect plan for us. But all along, it takes work. It takes faith. You know, they had to do it by faith. You think Rebecca, uh, they didn't have photographs back then. I can imagine those guys probably got in the sand and drove. This is what he looks like. Drew a picture of him, you know. She probably asked, well, what does he look like? She said, well, he's a nice guy. You ain't never told that about, do you? Is he good looking? Well, he's a nice guy. But she had to have faith in this plan. Now, I don't know what kind of relationship you're working on, but let me tell you about another relationship, a perfect relationship. The one is called the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm telling you, that's a perfect relationship. You know what makes that relationship perfect? They have the same mindset, have the same goals, and they're both all three willing to work for it. And it's not about them. It's about the unity of the Trinity. It's not about them. It's about the unity of the Trinity. Uh, God had a plan for a perfect relationship, even with man and woman. In fact, in his word, it said, they two shall come together to become what? One flesh. Now, the problem with that is a two flesh there. You think about what is a happy, perfect relationship. I imagine a lot of young guys thinking about getting married. They think about, yeah, what's a perfect, what's a perfect marriage? Coming home and supper on the table. You know, my paper laid out for me, and, and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. You know, you know what's wrong with that picture? Everything he's dreaming about is for about him. What's it, what am I going to get out of it? But perfect relationships, not about you, it's about them. You know what the Holy Spirit did the whole time? The Holy Spirit is ministering here on earth and even is doing today. He's talking about the Father and the Son. He's not talking about himself. That's what we do in a perfect relationship. It's for somebody else. When the division comes is when we get uh, selfish. Well, now, not only is the perfect trinity, uh, trinity uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and should be the man and woman come together in one flesh, but he talks about also the church. How we're supposed to be in a relationship with one another because we're to be the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. Now, when you think about a bride, you think about a, 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 a lady coming together and she's just perfect. I mean, she's perfect. She ought to be because most brides spend 30 years getting ready for that, you know. I mean, even the day of the wedding, you know, they, you can't have hardly a morning wedding because it takes too long to do the hair, the nails, and all the other things you've got to get ready because they're going to be perfect for that day. Perfect. Everything's got to be perfect. Now, the guy... There ain't nobody looking at you. You don't need to spend no money. They're looking at the bride. I mean, you think about it. The bridegroom comes in, they sit and look at you. The wedding party comes in, they look at you. But when the bride comes in, they all stand up. They got their eyes on the bride. The center of attention, the bride. Listen, church. We're the bride. We need to act like the bride. We need to look like the bride. We need to present ourselves as the bride. Can you imagine all of a sudden the wedding march starts, the door's open, there's the bride and her hair sticking up this way and her dress is torn, got mustard stains on. You know, you go, oh, come on now. Get it together. It's your day. But folks, guess what? Jesus is coming back for his bride. What kind of shape are we in? We've got to do our part. We can't blame somebody else. I've got to be responsible for my part. Paul, he said he, he knew he had a calling, he had a part. That's what he said in verse 1. It says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. 
unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be uh, saints with all that, uh, that in every place, called upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you. Peace from God our Father and from the Lord uh, uh, Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. He said, I've got a responsibility in this relationship. In any relationship, you have a responsibility, an obligation. You've got something to do. I've had to counsel some couples sometimes in their relationship. And every time that anybody wants to tell me about their relationship and the problem with their relationship, you know what the problem is? Him. Her. It's never me. It's never me. I've told you all this before, and I, I think it's a good doctrine. My wife, many years ago, I finally caught on. But any time we start having some problems, she'd say, number one, I know you're too stubborn for me to try to fix you, so I'm not going to try. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what the wife is supposed to do, and I'm going to be everything that I'm supposed to be. I'm going to let God take care of you. Because God's the only one who can't do anything with you. I can't do nothing with you. He'll either straighten you up, or he'll take you out and give me another one. That's where her attitude was. But I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Folks, that's the attitude we need to take. We don't need to blame everybody. We need to do our job. Paul said, this is my job. And I'm going to be the apostle. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to take my responsibility. It's my job. The problem is so many people are, are not worried about their job. They're worried about somebody else's job. And when you're worried about everybody else's job, guess what? You're not doing your job. Not doing your job. You need to do your thing. Don't blame it on nobody else. You think about a relationship. It was a relationship in God's uh, uh, word here. Uh, Elijah. God sent him down to this widow woman's house, her and her son. I got a relationship for you down there. She's going to take care of you and you're going to take care of her. So he goes down to this house and she, you know, it hadn't rained. Crops are dried up. There's no food. He's met this lady that he's supposed to be in this relationship with and he said that God had sent me here and, and he said, what you, I want you to go fix me something to eat. Fix me something to eat. Now think about that. Fix me something to eat. Now real quickly she can think, fix your own self something to eat. That's 2013, isn't it? Get your own self something. He said, no, you take care of me. And she did. And guess what? God took care of her. Because every time she thought she had enough to feed her son one last time, and they were just going to die of starvation. But because she did her part in that relationship that God put her in, next time she went to get something to eat, there was some more food there. And they ate it up. And the next day, there was some more food. Not only that, it was later on in their relationship. Guess what happened? I had she been so faithful to doing her job, her son dies. He's dead. She's probably thinking, oh, here I am doing everything I'm supposed to do, and here I am grieving because of all this. But guess what? God brought him back to life. Because she's doing her job. God's blessing in this relationship. God's blessing in this relationship. We need to be faithful in the jobs that God has called us to do. That word call means set apart. And the grace of God is mentioned here. It's talking about we need to be thankful for what we've got. Folks, I'm going to be honest with you. As a church here, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the church that I'm a part of. Folks, we're all different. I'll tell you what, I'm glad that everybody don't look like me. 
I appreciate no amens there, but I appreciate not everybody looks like me. I like to see some pretty faces occasionally. I appreciate that not everybody thinks the way I think. If everybody had the same characteristics I had, and everybody thought the way that I thought, and had the abilities that I have, I'd starve to death because I can't cook. I'm glad that some people cook. Now, I'll be honest. When it comes around our houses, if something happens wrong with the plumbing, we just might as well sell the place if it took my wife to fix it. Anything happened to the electricity and the lights wouldn't work, we'd just use flashlights if she had to do that. You know what? I'm kind of handy to have sometimes. Amen. <laughs> Just need to throw it in there occasionally. Not only that, she's kind of handy to have. It works out in a good relationship. As a church, it's good that we've got all different kind of folks. We're all different. Got different talents. It all works out. We don't have to be exactly the same, but we've got to be working for the same goal. Going in the same direction. The problem is we go in a different direction. That's when we got a problem. Going in the same direction. He says, talks about that in verse 6. He says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Confirmed in you. It's confirmed. That means it's evident that Christ is in you. Folks, it's not evident. It's not been confirmed in many people's lives that Christ is the lead. But it ought to be in your life. It ought to be in my life. It ought to be in the church's life. Confirmed. It's about Christ. Because listen, if Christ has got the lead in our relationship, it's a different kind of relationship as if we've got the lead. It's very much different. And we have hope. You know why we have hope? It says that in verse 9, God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Into the fellowship with Jesus and the church, God's faithful to take care of us. God's faithful to meet our needs. God's faithful to give us peace. God's faithful to give us directions in our life. God is faithful in the relationship with us. Unfortunately, there's people in the world that hadn't let Jesus into their heart and be part of their relationship. But folks, you need him. Because I'm telling you, when other people aren't faithful, he's always faithful. He's always true. He is a good person to be in a relationship with. Now, I realize I'm going to run out of time if I don't speed up. But he said, perfectly joined together. But he says... There's a division. There's a division. He goes down in verse 13. He says, many people uh, are divided. Some says that I'm of a Paul and I'm of a Paulus. I'm this way, I'm that way. He says, Christ is not divided. Christ is the same. Christ is not going to be two different ways. He's not two-faced. He's going to be in one direction. Christ is not divided. In a relationship, he's not divided. He's going in one direction. A lot of people seem to think their salvation is dependent upon their baptism. That has nothing to do with Christ. Christ is my salvation, not my baptism. My church membership is not my salvation. Jesus is my salvation. Now, if you want to try to mix things, folks, not only that, in your life, if you're going to be God's child and the world's child, that don't mix either. God's a jealous guy. In a relationship, you know what it means? You might be, you've got to be faithful in your relationship. Can you imagine me going and telling my wife that, man, I, I love our relationship, but I believe a third woman would really help. That relationship not going to last. She's selfish that way. Not only that, God's selfish that way. 
God wants us to be faithful to him as he is faithful to us. Let me tell you something. If you've got God, you don't need other things of this world. You don't need man's knowledge and man's uh, uh, wisdom and man's uh, uh, things. All you need is God. All you need is God. So he said, we need to preach the cross. And verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The power of God. Oh, the cross. We don't need to pollute anything with the cross. Jesus died upon the cross for my sins. He forgave me of my sins. He saved me. He put me in that relationship with Him. It's the power of my relationship. It's the power of my life. Now, there's a there's an old saying that goes around, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. There's a fellow who said that I, I don't, I, that's a good idea, and, and I think that, that would help me because I, I've heard that vitamins have a lot of uh, vitamins and it has a lot of uh, healthy stuff, in, you know, but I don't like apples. But he goes down to the fair, and at the fair they have this, the apples, and they dip them in this caramel, the bunch of sugar. And he says, you know what? I kind of like an apple dipped in that caramel stuff. But guess what's happened? All of a sudden, that healthy apple a day is not so healthy anymore. He may like it now that it's got a lot of sugar on it, but now something's lost something, it's nutrition. Now he's polluted all the nutrition of that apple. Can you imagine going to your doctor and saying, uh, are you eating right? Yeah, I eat an apple every day. Caramel apple. You know, man, that's your problem. You're taking something that's good and you're adding to it things that aren't good. Folks, we can take the things of God and try to add the things of the world. And that's what's happening in a lot of churches today. They want to try to mix in the world into the church, make it better. But folks, that just messes it up. It's the preaching of the Word and the cross of Jesus Christ. He said that's what saves people is the foolishness of preaching. He said, let me read a little further. For it's written in verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The preaching. Folks, I love singing. I love fellowship. I love dinners. I love all the things that we can do together as a church. But folks, we've got to have preaching of the Word. The Word cannot be substituted. The Word is important. Now, in the Word of God, sometimes listening to the Word preached and, and, and preaching the Word to others, sometimes it's a sacrificial thing. You've got to sit down and listen. But it's those things that have the nutrition, those things that help us in our relationship. A lot of times people want to work on a relationship after it's done been destroyed. The best thing to do is start it out in a good manner. I mean, after you've had a heart attack, that's a, that, you know, you need to start exercising after that, but it'd been a whole lot better if you started before the heart attack, right? We need to start out in this relationship to make this relationship perfect and doing the things that we ought to be doing. Well, let's say maybe I've gotten away from it. Maybe I, I've got a bad start off on this relationship that I need to have, first of all, with God, and then with my spouse, then with my family, with the church, if that relationship isn't what it ought to be, you need to start working on it. Now, there's one person that wants a relationship to be selfish. You remember who that was? Satan. In his relationship with God, what did he do? He wanted things for himself. He went to Eve in the garden and he said, you do this for yourself. Don't worry about what God said. You worry about yourself. That fruit is good to the eye. You worry about yourself. And what does selfishness do to a relationship? It split the relationship. Folks, as we come to the close, I want a perfect relationship with all relationships I have. I know you want the same. 
But in that relationship, it can't be selfish. In that relationship, we've got to work for one goal. Work for one goal. We've got, we forget about our, our, our selfish things and forget about our, our individual personalities. Think about what's important. And that's God in our relationship. Lifting up His name. Lifting up. He needs to be glorified. If we're going to boast about anything here today, it's not our preacher, it's not our music, it's Jesus, okay? That's what we need to boast about. We've got the greatest relationship with Jesus. And with a relationship with Him like it ought to be, it makes the other ones better. It makes the other ones better. We've got to get the first priority is with Him. Is our relationship as we come to this invitation what it ought to be? Or maybe you've never accepted Him as personal Lord and Savior. He wants a relationship with you. But he's waiting on for you. He done made the first move. He died on the cross. He done give you the invitation. Kind of like the little boy and girl said, I like you, you like me. He done give you the note. He's just waiting for a response. If you want to respond to him today, I invite you to do that. Maybe you've already responded, but you realize you've not been as faithful in this relationship as you should. He said he's faithful and just to forgive us and start us all over again in that relationship. If you need to get a little closer today in your relationship, you do so. Let us pray together.